Okay. Uh, all right, so we're going to start with the process of normal labor. Now I have to say, um, your chapter number may be off one or two numbers because we were working with two different editions. Your book is 11th edition to outline that they have this 10th edition. So just look at the six. Right, right. So just look at the name of your chapter. Okay. Ready? Yeah. All right. So the process of labor and birth. Okay, labor is the process by which the, the fetus, the baby, the placenta, the amniotic membranes, draw a cell from the uterus. Okay, it, it's pretty predictable. It means we know this series of events is going to happen, and the end result will be this. Okay. So you need to consider your four keys. So your pelvis, size and shape. You know, come out. You know, accommodate this baby. The passenger, so how big is the baby? Is it a really big baby with mama diabetic? Or, you know, is, she, is it a preemie baby? And what's the position? Is it head down? Is it breech? Is it transverse? The powers mean the effectiveness of your contractions. Are your contractions really, really strong every five minutes or are they every two minutes and aren't doing anything to dilate your cervix? So you can, like, you know, you need to have powerful contractions to actually change. And then the psyche of the mom, you know, is she prepared for this? Is this her first time baby? You know, is, is she have, you know, six kids at home? Like, it's not no big deal. She knows exactly what's going on. Um, how were her previous experiences? Were they traumatic? Was it a wonderful thing? So, you know, what does mom feel? Other factors are her preparation. So did she go to her, her prenatal visits? Did she get care? Um, her position, because you know, nobody wants to just lay there in bed. Maybe, you know, they want to sit up, they want to stand, they want to squat. Especially if they're going natural, they're not going to be able to sit still. You know, they want to move around. Professional help. You have midwives, you have physicians, you have nurses, you have anesthesia if you want it, you know, any kind of procedures that they do, and then just the people around her. You know, what's who's their support system. So this is what a pelvis looks like. Okay? And then you see your ischial spines right there, all right? And this is where the baby's head needs to come through. It needs to rotate and navigate its way through mom's pelvis to make it into the birth canal. So if mom's pelvis is, you know, more narrow, that baby's not gonna be able to come through, okay? She needs to have an adequate size. So the passenger. The, the, your baby, your fetus, your placenta, the membranes, and the amniotic fluid. Okay? So fetal head and its bony skull, there's lots of pressure put on the baby's head during labor. A lot of molding occurs. That's where they get that comb head. Okay? And the molding happens to allow the baby to, to come through the birth canal. Um, when your membranes are intact, so your water's not broken, you may feel a little pressure in your vagina, you know, as you're dilating. Once your membranes are broken and the, that water's gone, the cushion is gone, you have baby head on cervix, you know, and it, that hurts a lot. So moms start complaining of vaginal pressure, lots of rectal pressure, just, you know, I feel something down there, okay? Um, and as the baby moves down, the head elongates, the bones will overlap, that's why they're not fused. Um, and you have your fontanelles that you'll assess, you know, post-delivery. You have your anterior and your posterior, okay? So this is what the fetal skull looks like, right? So you feel like nothing's fused, everything can kind of mold its way, the baby comes down. And, I don't know, that's what they look like usually <laughs> when they come out. I don't know who this child is, but... <coughs> So then the baby in relation to mom's pelvis, so what's the attitude, the lie, baby's presentation, and then the position. Right. So the fetal attitude means how is the head and the extremities, are they flexed or extended? Flexed is normal, extended is not, all right? Head flexion, vertex. So you want the baby as it's coming down, chin tucked in, arms and legs in the fetal position, you know, that's why they call it that way. And that's the easiest way for them to come down. If the neck's 
extended, am I gonna come am I gonna come down on the top of her? No, right? Or if I have like my hand up here, am I coming down okay? No, right? So you need it all nice and tucked in. Alright, so here's an example of that. Flexion and then your extension. You want to flex. Fetal lie is the axis of the baby. Longitudinal is up and down, transverse is across. All right. So if mom comes in and they do an ultrasound on the baby to make sure, you know, is it head down, is it not, and they say, oh, baby's transverse, that means it's lying across her abdomen. So we're not in the right position for a vaginal delivery. Okay? Most likely she'll need a C-section, or if it's still early enough and she can, they try to rotate the baby externally to get it into a vertex position. There's always risks involved with that as well. So, but those, you know, those are the, the options. Um, fetal presentation. So, what part of the baby is presenting first in mom's pelvis? Is it the head? Is it the feet? Is it the butt? Okay. Is it the, you know, the shoulder? So here's just a, an example of a breech delivery. These are different um, types of breach. You have front breach, full, and then single foot. And this the way that they get that way is just them just wiggling around, yeah, moving around in there. Mm -hmm. If you have um, a mom that has polyhydramnios, so she's got a lot of amniotic fluid, you have a greater chance of that baby being in a, you know, Odd position just because that you yeah, had so much room in there, right? So, you know, they just kind of manipulate their ways into these positions. All right, so then your passenger, the fetal position is um, how is the baby's head in mom's pelvis? Okay, and I'll show you this with the, the little baby, the mannequin. So you'll, you hear, you know, someone say, oh, you know, how is the head? And they say LOA or ROA. That means the baby was left, like the octopus, anterior to the left. So I came down like this. And they say occiput to the right, anterior, I came down like this. If they say occiput posterior, I came down like this. Okay? So when you're ox, it's all about where the occiput is. Right. So if it's posterior, that means that I'm facing up in mom's belly. Okay? And the back of my head is hitting her tailbone every time she has a contraction. When you hear women say, oh, I have a lot of back labor, it's really hurting my back, I don't feel anything in my front, that's what that means. The baby's most likely occiput posterior or OP. Okay? They can deliver, it takes longer to get there, and you know, longer pushing, but they, they do deliver. So occiput yes. anterior is like if you were holding the baby in front of you like this. It's this way. Yeah. Let, let me let me grab the, the mannequin. I think it's it's um you'll get a better idea. So basically, the baby's back is on the mom's bed. Yeah, like back to bed. Yeah. Like back to bed. It's not like it's face. So all right. So here's my baby. I don't do it. I don't do it. It's this whole area like me just standing behind you. Head. Okay. You touch your head back. Your head will be hitting me. No, so no. I'm the mom. All right, and here's my baby in a vertex position. Okay, so as the baby is being delivered, if the head is this way, this is L O A. The occiput is anterior to my left. All right. If it's this way, it's R O A. Okay. If we're O P, we're like this. Okay. If we're transverse. We're like this. On the side. Okay. Yeah. So back right. to that. Their back is here. It's okay. So they should be like this. Okay. So sometimes if you have a mom who's okay, she's laboring and laboring, and the you know the head's not really coming down. What they'll say is you know change mom's position, turn her to the left for a little while turn it to the right and by doing that you're actually helping to adjust the baby and sometimes they do this and then they come out. Make sense?
station is how far the fetal um, head is in mom's pelvis, the, the presenting part. So um, you have above and below the initial spine, like I told you with that, that sheet, the baby. So above, below is plus one, plus two, plus three, above, minus one, minus two, minus three, zero is the initial spine, the baby's engaged, and then crowning, you can see that. And here's another example. Here. You're getting that. So um, your powers, your uterine contractions, they're self-limited. So, you know, maybe they're not too bad and mom can still move around and talk. Or maybe they are so bad that she can't talk to you at all and she's, you know, got the death grip on your hands. They're very painful. Um, the uterus is a muscle. And it contracts just like you do when you're you know, exercising, your muscles contract. But the uterus, it begins at the top and it just moves all the way down. And the best way I can kind of describe it is if you interlocked your fingers like this and you had a basketball and you tried with all your might to pop that basketball, the amount of force that you're exerting is basically what's happening to your uterus. It's just like, okay? And it stays there 60 seconds. 90 seconds, whatever it is, and then it slowly dissipates. Okay, so imagine that happening every two minutes inside of your body. Okay, not no fun. All right, so um, by doing this, by contracting this way, we're shortening and dilating the cervix. Okay, so you need to dilate to 10 centimeters, you need to efface to 100% and the baby needs to come down, okay? So when they do a badge exam, they say, oh, mom's, you know, five centimeters and 80%, that means that she's thinned out 80%. She's a little bit more to go, but it's almost completely gone, okay? Thin, yep, it's thin, it dilates and thin, okay? And with the contractions, it's causing the baby to put force on the cervix to dilate and bring the baby down into Right. Contractions can be um, involuntary, they just happen. Um, they can be um, forced, if we're using Pitocin or some other kind of medication. Um, people who have gone natural, say they want to do nipple stimulation, it's releasing oxytocin in your body or that they're giving you oxytocin through your IV or you know some other kind of medication that causes your body to um, we're looking for regular contraction patterns, not one over here and then one, you know, 15 minutes later and then one half an hour later. We'd like to see a regular pattern, you know, less than five minutes apart, consistent, okay? And they need to be strong enough to change your cervix. All right. So um, contractions are mo more um, likely to be seen better if mom is in a more laid back position, okay? Because you have your monitors on and everything. If mom's, you know, leaning forward, she's squatting, she's standing, you might not necessarily pick up on them all that great. You just need to readjust your monitor. Um, mom may feel that sideline is best for her, it takes the pressure off her back. You just have to kind of let her do her thing. Is that? Left side. Uh, well, left side, they say, tilt to the left because it displaces the uterus and doesn't put pressure on that vena cava. So you get the most blood and oxygen circulating to the baby, circulating through you. Um, but it's just the pressure, because everything relaxes. So moms, you know, they complain of back pain all the time. They're very uncomfortable at this point. So just laying on your side just releases some of that pressure that you carry on your hips and on your lower back, and it makes them feel better. Does it make your job easier monitoring them? Not necessarily, but they feel better. So you, know, you gotta go roll with it, all right? Um, so we want the cervix to thin and to dilate. Um, it's about two centimeters long, believe it or not, your your cervix, all right? So with each contraction, it needs to just shorten, 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 and thin itself out. All right, cervical dilatation is determined by badge exam. Um, your fingertip 
is like a half a centimeter. And you can put maybe one finger in, maybe one centimeter. And everybody's hands are different. Their fingers are different sizes. If you have thinner fingers, it might feel that she's dilated more. If you have, you know, chunkier fingers, it might feel that she's less. It's pretty subjective, but your exam should be in the same area, like the range that somebody else would do. So you're not going in and saying, oh yeah, she's two centimeters. It's like, um, no, she's complete. You know what I mean? So you need to be, you know, in the same area. So this is what the cervix looks like as the baby's head's coming down and dilating and thinning the cervix. So that's where you start. And that's where you should end up. So it's two centimeters long. So you see how it's long and it's thick? So as, as it dilates, it, it, it shortens and then it thins out. You see it's like all the way down. Contractions is the um, your increment is the period of increasing strength. Your peak is at the greatest point, and then um, it decreases. With external monitoring, we can't say, "Oh yes, you know that contraction is so much stronger than the previous one." It's external. We can't tell. If they use an intrauterine pressure catheter, then yeah, you could say that one is definitely stronger than little guy, the millimeters of mercury read to this, they would count on the day units, that kind of thing. Um, but external monitoring, if I sneeze, it'll register a number. If I, you know, vomit or cough, it'll register a number. So there's really, you really can't say, yes, that's, you know, strong or not. You can palpate her abdomen and you can feel, okay, they, they're mild or they're moderate or strong. So if you touch the tip of your nose, that's mild. You touch your chin, moderate. You touch your forehead, that's strong. Right? So you got an idea of what her contractions feel like just from touching her belly. Her belly or her, her belly, belly right? Um, well, in the beginning, they're going to be mild because she's, you know, early labor, so it's not going to be too much, just a little bit. By the time she gets to like eight, nine, ten centimeters, we're pushing, they should feel pretty strong. If you want them to be strong at the end because that's what's going to bring that baby down. So you push them with their contractions and that's how we're going to deliver. All right. Frequency, when you're counting your contractions, it's from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next. So that's how you count to say, okay, our contractions are five minutes apart or they're two minutes apart. The duration is how long it lasts. We count it in seconds, so you know it's 120 seconds, or it only lasts 40 seconds, or whatever. You know, count seconds. The intensity that is that mild, moderate, and strong, and then the interval is the time that it relaxes in between. Okay, you want to have at least two minutes in between your contractions, right? Because you want that baby to get a chance to get blood and oxygen flowing through. So, a, a, a way to think about it is. If you're swimming, right, and you're doing that, the breath stroke, okay, and you're coming up for air, you're going down, and you're coming up for air, you're going down, but you have your, you're taking your time, and you get a nice big gulp of air, and you're going back underwater. Well, let's increase, you know, the time that, you know, you're, you're down there, so we're only coming up for, you know, a few seconds and going back down. Well, eventually, you're going to get exhausted. You're not getting enough oxygen, right? Same thing with the baby. If your contractions are a minute apart or less, that kid's not going to have a chance to get that oxygen, right? Because when you have a contraction, everything gets cut off. So it's like taking that deep breath and going underwater, you're holding your breath. So you need that time in between to kind of recuperate, and then it comes again. Make sense? All right. So um, part of your labor process is the psyche, like I was saying. So mom, you know, may have some anxiety. She may have some fear, you know. Is she a teenager and she's, you know, all by herself? No, you know, a dad's not involved or, you know, maybe she doesn't have a great support system. Is she, you know, a woman who decided to put off having a child until later in life because she wanted to, you know, do her career first? You know, whatever it is. So all moms are going to have some anxiety. All moms may have some fear. 
And, you know, yes, even the mom who has six children at home, she's still going to be a little bit nervous. It's all, you're always nervous. Um, will she be able to cope with things a little bit better? Sure, because she's been through it. She knows what to expect. But she doesn't mean she's not going to be you know, less nervous. Um, you want to try to have mom relax as much as she can, whatever she needs to be comfortable. This should be an enjoyable part of her life. Okay. Um, so if she wants to have some music playing, that's fine. If she wants to take a nap, that's fine. Some places will say, you know, you can do clear liquids to kind of keep yourself hydrated. That's fine too. Usually we tell them don't eat because you don't want anything in your stomach. In case you go for a C-section, they, they put you under general. You don't want to aspirate anything. So we tell them don't eat anything, but you can do sips of clears, you know, to kind of keep yourself happy. Um, conserve your energy. So sometimes, you know, moms come in, it's time to have my baby today, and I'm just going to be on Facebook, and I'm texting everybody, and I'm talking to everybody, and I don't want to sleep, I don't want to do anything, I just want to be up and just enjoy this. But guess what? By the time we get to 10 centimeters, it's time to push, you're going to be exhausted, girlfriend, so go to sleep, <laughs> okay? So conserve your energy as much as possible. A lot of women who um, do get their epidurals, you'll you may see that they get very tired and sleepy afterwards. And it's not necessarily the effects of her, you know, getting crap control. Yes, it drops your blood pressure a little bit, but you haven't really slept for nine months. You finally get a chance to relax. So yeah, your body's gonna be like, you know what? I'm taking it. <laughs> so, you know, tell them it's okay. Absolutely. Um, events that happen before the onset of labor is lightning. Um, vaginal discharge, so mom's bloody show. She gets that energy spurt, she runs around cleaning the house and trying to get everything ready. False labor, spontaneous rupture of membranes, and cervical changes. All right. So lightning is as the baby's starting to settle in mom's pelvis. So if you ever had a, you know, someone who's pregnant or you're pregnant, you know, and they say, oh, you dropped. You know, you look really low. That's what that means. The baby's settling itself. Um, mom finds it easier to breathe when this happens because the baby's not pushing up on her diaphragm. Um, but she will be urinating more frequently because the head's putting pressure on her bladder. She'll get more leg cramps, unfortunately, and more edema in the lower extremities towards the end. She'll end up with little, you know, chicken nugget <laughs> Um Blood tinged mucus plug um, for bloody show it will dislodge from a cervical os. Um, you may or may not um, break some water at that time. You know, it's usually when you see more of blood tinged mucus, that things are happening. Very vascular area, so as blood vessels pop, you'll see more of that. If you just have a non blood tinged mucus plug, that just means your castrum mucus plug doesn't necessarily mean you're going into labor. Things may eventually start, but it's not going to happen right then and there. If you start to see blood, that's a different story. Okay. Um, the energy spurt, so they have that nesting phase. So they're running around making sure that things are ready for baby, that things are ready for the house. You know, if they have other children or pets, they're going to be trying to get everything taken care of before they go into labor. Um, and you want to try to tell mom, don't overdo it. Some of them go seriously, like hands and knees, scrubbing the tub, getting, you know, just you know, get what you need ready, but don't go crazy. Okay. The Braxton Hicks contractions are painless. Okay, it's kind of a way of your body practicing on what it's going to be doing. You are aware of them, yes, but they don't necessarily hurt, and they will not change the cervix. Some people do get concerned about it. Go and contracting and contracting, and they come in and they're there, you know, for however many hours, no change in their cervix and they get sent home. And sometimes you see them a few times before they actually kick into labor. It's just, you know, false labor, okay? Um, the difference between true and false is that true labor, you will actually see cervical change. So if mom comes in, oh, you know, I think I'm in labor, I'm not sure, they check her and she thinks she's two centimeters, and then two hours later, they check her again, now she's four. Yeah. You actually, you know, you did some change. They check her again and she hasn't, she's still two, then no, you know, you send her home, all right? 
rupture of membranes, or you know, SHRAM, which is spontaneous. AROM would be artificial, so they can break the water for you, is when your water breaks. You feel, may feel a trickle or, or a really big gush of fluid. Um, some moms have said they actually felt or heard a pop, and then you know they felt the water. But they get up to go to the bathroom, they think that everything's all well and good, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, am I still peeing? What's going on? Your water broke. Um, it's uh, best to call your physician, you know, as soon as you can when your water breaks. So, you know, usually your labor will eventually start. If your group beta is strep positive, you want to get into the hospital or wherever you're being treated as soon as possible. Usually they'll give you um, antibiotics to cover that GBS, the group beta strep. So you don't want to prolong that in any way because that GBS will affect the baby, okay? So you want to get in there and get your antibiotics. If your labor does not start, because you know, oh, if my water broke, I have to deliver before, you know, this time I'm, you know, my clock is set. Not always true. As long as your baby is fine and you're, you're afebrile and everything looks okay, yeah, you can have a really long labor that may be 25 or 26 hours, not necessarily, you know, delivering within that 24 hour period. <coughs> If you do start to get a fever or show signs of, you know, some kind of infection, then we are going to start you on antibiotics and try to deliver you. And most places they'll probably give you glucosin to kind of get the ball rolling because they don't want to sit on you rupture for a long period of time. But it does not necessarily mean like got to do it now. You know, they give your body a chance, see if it goes into labor. If not, then they help you. Right? If you come in for um, you know, I think I broke my water, I'm not really sure. There are a few tests that they do to confirm. Nitrogen paper test is that litmus paper. So they, they have it either on the paper, like a paper itself or a Q-tip, and you would swab the area, and if the paper turns dark blue, then yes, you, will, you know, that's one sign. Another thing they look for is called pooling. So when they go in with the spec exam, like to do a spec exam, and they see a collection of fluid in the vagina, that's called pooling. And then the third test they do is called burning. So what they would do is take a sample of that fluid, put it on a microscope slide, and then look under the microscope. And if she is ruptured, you will see fern patterns, you know, like the fern leaves of that plant. You will see the, that pattern on the, under the microscope. So if they have burning, then yes, you're ruptured. And if there are no ferns, Um, cervical changes, usually um, your longest time is from zero to four centimeters, okay? After that, it's usually about a centimeter an hour, um, and the cervical change is what we're looking for. So once mom gets to four centimeters, she's considered active, and everything kind of progresses from that point on, all right? And then here is just pictures of the different stages as the baby's coming down through mom's cup. Okay. All right, so cardinal movements are a series of actions that reflect changes in the posture of the fetus as it adapts to the birth canal. Most of them will take place during the second um, stage. All right, so in labor, uh, we have the mechanisms or posture changes um, are dictated by pelvic diameter, so what's mom's pelvis like, soft tissues, size of the baby, and strength of the contraction. Can you tell me the, um, the pelvic diameter, what is this going to be? Well, it, 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 it's different. Okay. So, but like, what, what would be too small? I remember we had a question like that. What would be considered too small? Mm -hmm. One to two inches or something? I think it was a that, Yeah, I thought that was a question. The diam um, it's back on that, if you flip back through your, towards the beginning where I had that picture of the pelvis. Mm -hmm. You see it? And what would we be looking at? Would be the trans Well, trans, yeah. Trans, oh no. Are you sure a question where it was, it was like one to two inches? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the ischial spine. Spine, the yeah. Head yeah. Head like the baby's head is normally like around four to five, is that mm -hmm. why? Yeah. So if it was two inches wide, 
that baby's head. Right. So they reached the so, um, yeah. Yeah, we're looking at the transverse. I think that the the test question had been about yeah, 13 the initial inches in the mm -hmm. ischial spine. Thirteen centimeters from one ischial spine to the next. Because your that's average five inches. inches is your average fetal head is about that size. Okay, it's about five. So one to two then. Right. So you want to, um, yeah, like as things are molding and it's coming through, it's going to get squished into that area. So if you have, if you look at the picture and you actually have a narrow pelvis this way, it won't fit. Okay. If you have a narrow pelvis this way, it won't fit. So when it needs to be all it needs to be gynecoid. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and not not everyone's the same. You know what I mean? Like unfortunately, like you know, some have narrow, some have you know very wide. You know, just and had those women, you know, back in the day, they're pregnant. You know, working, doing whatever around the house, they go into labor and narrow pelvis. You saw a lot more, you know, fetal death back then because <coughs> the baby wouldn't come out, you know. And you can't change that. That, 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 that's, that's your makeup, yeah. In pregnancy, you have um, uh, that relaxing that, you know, relaxes everything and kind of softens it. So that sometimes you know helps, but your your makeup is how you are. You have large frame, like big bones, or you have small frame. That's just how you're made up. So if it's you know unfortunate if you have a narrow pelvis and you really wanted a vaginal delivery, but is it genetics that your mom has big pelvis? Not necessarily, because some you know like with with mine, my mom had vaginal deliveries, but mine were C-section. I had bigger babies, you know what I mean? So everybody's different. Usually they say though, you know, if, if the women in the family had decent, you know, birthing experiences that, you know, yours, you know, should be fine, but that doesn't mean that you won't end up with a C-section. You know, mom was fine, but you may still end up, end up with gestational hypertension or, you know, diabetes. Everybody's different. The diets back then were different. You know, the era of smoking and drinking during your pregnancy, you know, we don't do that anymore. You know, we watch what we eat better. And, you know, so it's, you know, a lot of things play into it, but your bones are your bones. You know, you can't really do much. Um, all right, so labor proceeds along the path of least resistance. So, you know, if you're, if you think about it, as you're, um, so you're going like down a slide, right? You're going down the slide and it's just open and completely free, you're going to fly through, right? Well, if you have obstacles in your way, you're going to try to wiggle your way to get to where you need to go, right? So, same thing. Least resistance is the best, you know, the best way that it goes. Um, okay, so adaptive movements, so fetal head and shoulders, so we have engagement and descent, flexion, internal rotation, extension, external rotation, and expulsion. Right. Floating. The baby's head is not engaged. So if they go in, they do a bad exam, they say, oh, the head's floating. That's negative. It's, right, you're in the negative. So you're like minus three, the head's not engaged. You would not want to rupture someone who is floating because then the cord could come out first and prolapse. Okay, so. So here's an example of a floating head. Engagement occurs when the head reaches the level of the ischial spine. The presenting part is at zero station. Okay. So here's your engagement. Flexion enables the smallest part of the baby's head to enter into the birth canal. So here is what in, like the internal rotation and further descent look like. And then fetal head rotates um, from transverse. So it'll actually start. If you look at the little um, pictures of the head in the pelvis and you look at each like slide on your page, you'll see as the baby comes down, it will start to yeah. turn. Yep. 
Extension begins as the fetal head reaches the pelvic floor, so it pivots under the pubic bone and advances upward. Um, this part during mom's labor is actually very frustrating because she's pushing and pushing. She does, you know, pushes the three, you know, three times with each contraction. We see a little bit of head and then nothing. And th at this point, we tell them it's two steps forward, one back until the baby gets to the pubic bone and then it's forward from that point on. But that, up to that point, that's where they're frustrated. Are you seeing anything yet? Is anything happening? I don't even know if I'm pushing right. You know, most that have an epidural. What, you know, what's going on? Why is it taking so long? Um, as extension progresses, the occiput appears in the vaginal opening, so we start to crown, and then it's completed on delivery of the fetal head. Right. So here's what complete extension looks like. External rotation is called restitution. So I, you know, as the head comes out, you know, you can kind of feel for, you know, which way is the baby going to actually go? Cause just because the head comes out this way doesn't mean the rest of the body is, you know, coming that way too. So we want to make it as easy as possible. So they may turn the head to see which way it comes. Um, it occurs after the, the head delivers. The head immediately rotates to transverse position. The shoulders align themselves uh, to the pelvic um, outlet, all right? So this is restitution. So the head down, now we're gonna start to deliver the shoulders, okay? So we go down first and then up. So this is where we can run into some issues with shoulder dystocia. So if mom you know, didn't go to her visits, uncontrolled diabetes, you know, whatever it is, the shoulders can get stuck at this point. Okay. Expulsion is the anterior shoulder rotates forward and delivers, followed by the posterior. So you'll see them bring the baby down and then up. The rest of the body is delivered, and the birth of the fetus ends at the second stage of labor. So here's the delivery of the anterior and posterior shoulder. Right. And then, um, Placental expulsion, it can take anywhere from five to 30 minutes for the placenta to come out. Usually it's fairly quick. Um, they don't want, you don't want them pulling on the cord. You want the body to deliver the placenta, have it detach on its own, um, and let nature take its course. It's good um, for them if they're collecting cord blood. A lot more people are doing the cord blood banking. They have cord blood donation now. The hospital may need a sample. So after they cut and clamp the cord and the placenta is still in utero, this is where they would collect their cord blood you know, for banking or donation. And then after that's done, then they'll help. The full massage, mom's fun is to try to help deliver the placenta, but never do you want to pull on the cord because you can actually detach the cord and cause some serious bleeding. Um, signs that the placenta has separated is you'll see the cord start to lengthen. There's a change in shape of mom's uterus, and you may see a trickle or a gush of blood from the vagina. And at this point, they would, you know, still do fundal massage, and they would say to the nurse, you can, you know, turn on her pit, or if people, you know, if they've gone natural, sometimes they'll say, give her, you know, Pitocin IM, so she'll get a shot in her thigh, and, you know. It's just the two sides of the placenta. So one side they call dirty Duncan, and the other side is the shiny. Yeah. So the Duncan side is where you see all those cotyledons. That side, the side that was attached from us. That's where all that that all those networks of vessels were. And on the shiny side, the pretty side, is the baby side. Yeah. But that's not bad. No, that's just the way. No, nothing's wrong. You can have issues with. You know, the way that the vessels come off, you know, maybe you're supposed to have three vessels in your umbilical cord. Sometimes you may hear them say, oh, we have a two vessel cord. Or they may have a villamendous cord insertion. They, there's is issues you can have, but, you know, the dirty duck inside is on mom and the shiny shoulder is on baby side. But that, that's just the way that it is. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, once the placenta comes out, you want to take a look at it. 
like we were talking about in SIM, and see if you know if mom had any issues or any kind of trauma happened and she had a lot of lates. Look and see. Do you see any calcifications on her placenta? How did things look? Do you know look on mom's side to see if anything was going on? I mean, you're going to inspect the whole thing, but look to see if is there you know anything that's off, like off. And if, usually if the physician suspects something or if they noted something during her pregnancy or her labor or delivery, they'll say send it to um, pathology so we know. Okay? So here's your, your Duncan. So it's the side that's, you know, on mom's side and then the fetal side. All right? And then delivery of the placenta ends third stage of labor. All right. First stage is the longest, like I was saying, zero to four. Um, and it's, it can be quite taxing, I guess, on mom. She's exhausted. It, just, it does take a long time. And then after that, it's about a centimeter an hour. Um, everything is, uh, this stage is complete when cervix is fully effaced and dilated. Right? Phases of first stage is your latent, your active, and your transition. So latent phase, stage one is zero to four centimeters. Mom's talking, I'm smiling, I'm having such a good time, I'm here to have my baby, it's great, we have the nursery all set, my contractions are 10 to 15 minutes apart, and they're only lasting 15 to 20 seconds. I feel great. Okay, latent phase, stage one. Contractions become stabilized, usually mild, per 10 to 15 minutes. Fetal descent begins in earnest, Woman is able to focus on any teaching. So, you know, we're going to be changing positions, Mrs. Smith, you know, as you know, as you need to, you can, you know, still do ice chips. And I'm, I'm good with that. Thank you. I feel great. Active phase, stage one. Contractions are stronger and longer. They're increasing 30 to 45 seconds and occur about every five minutes. Intensity is moderate to strong. And this is where they dilate around four to seven centimeters. So I'm um, starting to breathe through my contractions a little bit and I'm really uncomfortable now and maybe I just want an epidural and I'm not having fun, okay? I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> All right, so she's starting to change her tune a little bit. She's not, you know, she, she can still answer your questions, but she's just <clears throat> not feeling it. Transition stage, stage one to stage two. Violation um, is eight to 10 centimeters. Mom may start saying some things that are, you know, unpleasant to your ears. She may be acting a certain way. Now, granted, that usually occurs with women that don't have an epidural. Women who have an epidural kind of coast through their labor, I'm not saying it's not long and drawn out, but they don't feel their contractions as much. They feel rectal pressure when they get to this point. If you have vaginal pressure, it may be a little uncomfortable, but compared to someone going natural, that's a whole different ball of wax. You may hear them from outside of their room, or if you happen to be a patient in the next room, you may hear them in your room. Like I said, words are said, you know, sounds are heard, things happen, mom's not having any fun at this point. Okay, get it out. <laughs> All right, so she's restless and I'm not gonna follow your directions because I don't care. I just wanna sit how I wanna sit and I don't wanna be in this position. And I'm having a hard time breathing so now I'm hyperventilating and I'm really hot and sweating because my body's working really hard and I may belch and pick up. I may vomit on you or I'm just nauseous. Um, I have lots and lots of um, pressure in my rectum. I feel like I wanna have a bowel movement and I just wanna be left alone, get this baby out. <coughs> All right. Completion of transition phase, woman may feel like a splitting sensation by the force of her contractions and the pressure of the fetal head near the cervix. Uh, one person described it to me as picture chicken, uh, a whole chicken, okay? Grab it by the drumsticks and go like this. Crack! Yeah, that's what they said they felt like with, from that pressure. Yeah, kind of scary. As the head descends, she may have the urge to push. Um, there's pressure on the sacral nerve from the head. The perineum will begin to bulge and flatten, and you may see the head at the opening as she's getting closer. 
So there are things to look for as moms push in, like, oh yeah, you know, we're getting close. All right. Second stage of labor and delivery begins when the you know, cervix is dilated to the birth of the fetus. Um, she will feel the urge to bear down. She's going to use her abdominal muscles to assist with the contraction. So you only want her to be pushing with her contractions. You don't want her pushing without them because then she's basically wasting her energy. So push with your contractions. Um, this is coach her not to hold her breath more than five seconds. A lot of places will tell the mom, hold your breath to a count of 10, push down, blow it out, take another breath in, push again for a count of 10. Um, it is exhausting to mom. Moms who have epidurals might not know if they're pushing properly. They tend to scrunch their face. They're wasting their energy in their face instead of on their bottom. Sometimes women break their blood vessels in their face. You want to try to tell her, yeah. You want to try to tell her, just relax your face and push like you're trying to have a bowel movement. Okay. A lot of women feel nervous or embarrassed about having a bowel movement while, deli while they're going through their delivery. You just pull the chuck away, get rid of it, don't draw any attention to it. And we usually tell them, if you do, then you know you're doing it right. You know, that it's, it's a part of what's supposed to happen. You know, um, some women will get so freaked out about it, they will actually give themselves an enema before they come in. It's not common practice for that to be done anymore. Um, some women, you know, or what, the castor oil? Some, well, some have said, you know, I'm going to put myself in the labor, I'm going to drink some castor oil. Well, the only thing that really will do to you is give you massive diarrhea that the nurses will have to take care of because you decided to give yourself, you know, some castor oil. Okay, it will bring on contractions, yes, because you're contracting everything, you know. Everything's trying to, you know, get rid of that. But, yeah, it's just going to give yourself some massive diarrhea. Don't do it. <laughs> um, second stage uh, is your cervix is 100% dilated. She uses her, um, her abdominal muscles to help increase that force to bring the baby down. So bearing down is what we tell them to do, push down. All right, Valsalva maneuver, so you have two versions. You have closed glottis and open glottis. Closed glottis is when you're holding your breath and you're counting to 10. Most hospitals will do that. Open glottis is what you'll see more at like a birthing center. So you're actually releasing the breath as you're pushing down. Um, different practitioners have different reasons of why they do things the way that they do. The closed glottis, they feel that you're you're keeping that pressure in, you're building in that, you know, that abdominal pressure, and you're, you know, using more force. Whereas if you're, you know, screaming or letting your breath go, you're losing all that, you know, so it just it depends on who your, you know, who your practitioner is. Um, but if you uh, prolong it, it can diminish perfusion to the placenta, and it can result in fetal hypoxia. So you want mom to make sure that she does take her breath in between, that she does rest. It's okay if she doesn't push with one of the contractions or two. Let her catch her breath, get some rest. It is exhausting. Mom can push anywhere from 30 minutes to three plus hours. So it's okay if she misses one or two years. Now let, her, let her get some rest. So here's the open glottis breathing, like I was saying. So they're releasing their air. So can you demonstrate closed glottis? So closed glottis is like you take a deep breath in and you uh, push down for a count of 10 seconds, but no throw. Like, okay. Open glottis is and you're like letting your breath go. So you're not with it while you're pushing. So you're not holding it in there. Um, and like I said, some people are like, no, 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 don't make any sounds. Don't don't let your breath go, hold it in. Close glottis, they want that. Because it's more, they feel more forceful. With the open glottis, you're letting that energy go and you're not really doing anything. But, you know, again. So which one is the Yeah. Well, in, like where I work, they, they do close glottis. Okay. And that would tire me out. It will, but um, you, you find, I found that um, with open glottis, you tend to just kind of, 
it, your your force is just dissipated as you're letting it go. And some, you know, they'll sit there and they'll they'll you know push down, but they're making a lot of noise, so they're they are letting things go that way. So, I mean, you don't really say to a woman, "Don't make any noise and hold your breath and don't say anything," you know? but you know you want to try to use as much force as you can to help deliver the baby. Because I mean, it, it, you can prolong pushing. I had one woman who was so afraid of having a bowel movement, she was you know, three and a half hours into pushing and there was like nothing going on. And finally she said, I just, I'm really scared, I don't want to have a bowel movement. It's like, honey, like, you can have this kid out like that if you would just actually do what you're supposed to, you know? So, and the doc said to her, either you're gonna do it, you know, push what you're supposed to, or you're gonna end up with a C-section. Like, we can't leave you go like this, you know? So. No, she, she delivered and she didn't have a bowel movement. I mean, you know, yeah, she was just so scared. You know, some people do get away with not having a bowel movement, you know, whatever. They haven't eaten for however long, there's nothing there. You know, other people have McDonald's on their way in. <laughs> so, all right, second stage of labor, uh, delivery can last from a few minutes to two hours. The fetal head causes the bulging of the perineum. Crowning occurs when you see the head at the opening. Um, and then the head appears to recede between contractions. This is that two steps forward, one back I was telling you about. So as she's pushing, you see a little bit more of the head, and then it comes back in. And then you see a little bit more, and it goes back in. How does it do that? It's just as a muscle? It, it's as it's making its way down. It's point. Right. So it comes down, and once it gets under that pubic bone, it's kind of like, okay, I'm locked in there now, and I, you know, I'm coming. So contractions are forceful every two to three minutes, lasting up to you know, 60 to 90 seconds. You'll see more bloody show, and you have to remind moms that you know they get nervous about it. Like, why am I seeing blood? There shouldn't be any blood. You know, bleeding is bad, but at this point, your cervix is dilating. You're going to see it, and it's okay. You just want to keep tabs on how much you see. Episiotomies are not um, common practice anymore. They will let you. Um, just stretch and sometimes tear, you know, depends on the elasticity of your perineum. Um, average is a second degree laceration. So yeah, you need some repair, but if they find that, you know, you're pushing